This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's the place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome, folks. Here we are one more time at Core Brain Journal. This is Dr. Charles Parker, and this is Core Brain Journal 040. We have a very interesting physician who's with us. He's a geriatric psychiatrist, Dr. Gary Moak, and he has written a book, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Welcome, Gary. We're pleased to have you on board. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here with you today. So Gary has written a book called Beat Depression to Stay Healthier and Live Longer. He is a geriatric psychiatrist. Now, I have the privilege of seeing him. We're doing a Skype interview, and the guy looks young. You often think, this is me, maybe not you, uh, that a geriatric psychiatrist would indeed be geriatric. I don't know how old Gary is, but he's not geriatric looking. He may be 95, but he looks like he's about 50. So uh, that's an interesting point. You have a young guy who's really interested in getting something done with the geriatric population. Let me just read a little bit of his bio, and then we'll find out a little bit about him personally. So he is a practicing geriatric psychiatrist with over 30 years experience. He's been treating older, older adults with a wide range of psychiatric and behavioral problems related to diseases of aging. He's an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Gazelle Medical School at Dartmouth, where he serves as chief of geriatric psychiatry at the New Hampshire Hospital. In addition to his clinical work with older adults and their families, he teaches medical students and doctors in training about mental health and aging in the treatment of late life mental health problems. Dr. Moak regularly speaks to audiences of older adults and members of their families about mental health and aging. And I'll tell you, he's got an opinion that we're missing something, friends, and he's going to tell us about it. So first of all, uh, please, Gary, give us a little bit about your personal life, if you could. Well, as you already said, I, I practice at the Geisel Medical School at Dartmouth. So I live up here in New Hampshire. That's um, a recent transition for me. I was in private practice in central Massachusetts for 20 years before having to close that practice and move to New Hampshire. And part of that had to do with uh, changes in the healthcare system that made it hard to continue practice as a private practitioner. Part of it had to do with a desire to spend more time teaching mm -hmm. and educating uh, medical students and doctors in training and others. And part of it was a lifestyle choice to be able to uh, live up in uh, the northern forest up here and enjoy a more outdoor lifestyle. Oh, yeah. Well, that's great. Are you a fisherman? I, I don't, although I have a number of friends who are very serious fishermen who are always trying to rope me into the sport, so to speak. I, I enjoy a lot of hiking and, and biking and cross-country skiing in the winter. Um and just spending a lot of time outdoors in a lot of ways. Well, that's it's beautiful country up there. So, so Gary, tell us a little bit about what got, what was the burr under your saddle that really provoked you to say, "Hey, I've got to write this really good book." By the way, folks, we're going to be giving this book away. It'll be a, a drawing with the uh, on the show notes, and it's going to be corebrainjournal.com forward slash slash zero four zero drawing. And uh, that's where you'll be able to find it if you're just listening to this in the two weeks that follow the launch of this of this podcast. So, you know, tell us about what was that burr under the saddle, Gary, that, that made you say, hey, I've got to do something. I've got to speak up to this point. Uh, so, as you mentioned, I've uh, been a geriatric psychiatrist in practice in one setting or another for 30 years. So that, that ought to tell you I'm probably older than I, I look. Uh but I, I appreciate the compliment that I look younger. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that's impressed me because I've, I've treated older adults with problems related to Alzheimer's disease and related disorders uh, and problems related to depression or anxiety and depression. But and what's impressed me uh, among many of the challenges they face, both in terms of, of getting help and getting our healthcare system to address their needs, is the lack of information available to them. That's just, just people come in and they're desperate. They're desperately looking for help. They're desperately looking for information. 
And it's been hard for them to find it. They haven't been able to get it from their primary care doctors. They haven't been able to get it from other healthcare prof professionals they work with. And these days, they, they increasingly they go on the on the internet, or their adult children go on the internet, and they come in frustrated that there's a lot of stuff there, but nothing that's clear, um, uh, 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 accurate, or um, not confusing. So they're 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 looking for information, and I I felt that um, I could I could provide that based on my experience of answering their questions over thirty years. That's great. So what was the? That's a larger picture. Can you tell us what really hit you hard? That said, that what was the turning point in your life where you said this is where I've got to sit down and do it? Was there a patient? Was there an experience? Was there something you just really got to you and you said, I've got to, I've got to take this down and, uh, and write it down. Well, it's a, it was really a few things. The, the first is that um, depression in older adults is a very common problem. Uh, Alzheimer's has become a household term and it affects um, maybe one in nine uh, people over the age of 65. But depression, I think, is actually a, a bigger public health problem and, and in many ways causes more misery to older adults. It, it may be the single greatest threat to quality of life in old age and maybe the single greatest um, risk to or, or to jeopardize uh, the golden years. Um, but people don't see it that way. People don't see depression as a serious brain disorder, as a medical illness that requires medical attention. Yeah. And moreover, they don't recognize that depression is not just a harmless emotional state. It really takes a very devastating toll on physical health and longevity. And nobody knows that. And most most healthcare professionals don't understand that either. So um, and, and and as one of about 1500 some odd geriatric psychiatrists in the United States, my ability to, to help people out there, uh, vast numbers of older adults who don't know where to turn for help and don't have access to a specialist like me, was a source of frustration and discouragement over the years. So I thought uh, getting this into a book that people could access that would be readable and understandable uh, to people who don't have professional education, um, that would uh, connect with them and help the help answer the questions they have and provide them the information they need seem pretty compelling. You know, Gary, it's it's so true in my practice. I've seen it happen repeatedly that older folks come in and people look at depression as, hey, that's part of aging. That's what happens. I mean, wouldn't you be depressed if you were an older person? And uh, that's that does put a, a a person who has any kind of appreciation of depression really on edge because so many people are overlooked because they're written off in that regard. Absolutely. And because there's this view that it's just part of what happens to you when you get old or that you ought to be able to handle your problems because after all, you're in charge of your own your own mind. Uh, it, it, it adds a burden of stigma to older adults uh, about being depressed and about seeking help. So that's a real problem. You'd be surprised how often patients will tell you, you mean this is a real medical disease? You mean it's just not me causing this? And you mean it's just not par for the course of getting older? And they're often surprised to learn that this is a serious brain disease. It, it, you, we can actually, with, with modern uh, high-tech brain scanning technology, we actually can, can look into the brain and see what's not working in, uh, when people have depression. And, you know, we know this is a brain disease that's that's treatable. And moreover, we also know that that getting old isn't depressing, that that older adults on average have much higher levels of happiness and lower levels of sadness than younger people do. Most people are shocked to learn that. But it's true. If they if they don't have the depression, right, <laughs> if, if, if they don't have depression. Right. So let me ask you this, because now you've piqued our listeners interest as you have mine. And let's talk a little bit about your book and what you go into that would be helpful in terms of discerning what an individual is really suffering with, what kind of tests, what kind of exploration, what do you recommend to evaluate an individual who seems to be stuck in some way, confused in later life? 
Well, so that that's a, the, the word stuck that you use is a really good term. So if somebody is not feeling like themselves, they, their their mood is not as happy uh, as as usual. They don't have the level of equanimity they usually have. They seem to be uh, mentally sluggish. Uh, they've lost interest in things. Their levels of motivation are low, and they seem forgetful. Their their thinking has become kind of sluggish or fuzzy. Uh, that should be recognized as some as an abnormality. Number one and number two, it should be seen as potentially a serious medical problem that requires proper medical attention. Mm -hmm. And that means starting with their primary care doctor. Uh, and many times, the primary care doctor does a pretty decent job. Even even in face of the barriers and limitations primary care doctors face these days, True. some of them do a very nice job. Mm -hmm. But if the primary care doctor isn't taking it seriously enough or looking into it and investigating it carefully enough or addressing it uh, thoroughly enough, it means seeing a specialist. Now, in my book, I have a whole chapter on what to look for. What's the good ho housekeeping, so to speak, seal of approval for what's a good evaluation and a good approach to treatment. But it, it involves a certain thoroughness in terms of, of sitting down with a person, understanding the history of how the symptoms evolved, what seemed to bring them out, what exactly the symptoms are and how do they affect the person. And then really spending the time reviewing the rest of their health, the medicines they take, the other conditions they have, um, habits they have, lifestyle factors, all things that can, uh, in subtle or very overt ways, affect brain function and contribute to depression. Putting all that, it, analyzing that all together and trying to understand whether, in fact, they have depression or what type of depression it is and what might be contributing to it or causing it and then developing a treatment plan that's comprehensive and thorough enough to address it, and then seeing the person regularly to see the treatment through to make sure it, it not only agrees with the person, um, but actually it gets the results you want. That, that commonly, one of my sources of frustration is people make the right diagnosis and then prescribe a medicine for an older adult and tell them to come back in a year or so or sooner if they don't get better, and that just doesn't work. It's not, not appropriate. It's no. Not need to see people regularly and work with them on a regular basis until they're better. So you said something rather quickly, and I just wanted to pursue this uh, brief reference. Do you do uh, scans up there at uh, Dartmouth? What kind of, you said something about scanning, and I just was wondering what that was in reference to. So um, the standard scans that are widely used in clinical practice are going to be familiar to many listeners, and they include uh, CT or CAT scans and MRI scans, magnetic resonance imaging scans, which give you pictures of the brain structure. And we use those scans to look for evidence of strokes, brain tumors, bleeding in the brain, or evidence of poor circulation that could cause the brain to fail, um, bringing about symptoms of depression, possibly as an earliest tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We have other scans, which are functional brain imaging scans, including things like SPECT scans, PET scans, um, functional MRI, various forms of MRI scan that give us pictures in real time uh, with the patient in the scanner of what the brain is doing. That's a very fundamental change. Mm -hmm. These scans are changing our understanding of brain function and how it relates to normal emotions and thinking and, and psychiatric illness. Unfortunately, they're not yet widely available enough for routine clinical practice so that we don't have them as clinical tools. We don't use them routinely even in a university medical center like Dartmouth. Um, but they are changing our understanding of what's going on in patients' brains when they're suffering and what we can do to help them. Yes, I, I quite agree. I've done SPECT imaging since uh, 2003. I worked with Eamon in D.C. And, and have done a lot of SPECT imaging. And when you look at the brain, it changes the way you think about psychiatry overall because you can see the biology so uh, absolutely uh, apparent on on the scans when you see it it changes the way you think because you realize there's more going on than what that individual presented in the office with I, I tell my patients that if you th think of the brain as like a house or analogous to a house a CT scan or an MRI would tell you where the beams are it would tell you where the walls are 
It would tell you where the roof is. It might tell you where the plumbing and the house wiring are. But a SPECT or a PET or a functional MRI would tell you what the temperature is in all the different rooms. <laughs> it might tell you how warm the water is, where hot water is flowing, <laughs> and the like. And it might tell you where the plumbing is leaking. Excellent metaphor, Gary. Love it. Very good. That's so true. Very well said. So then what do you do? We, we do a lot of uh, IgG testing. We look at Im immune dysregulation uh, a lot. We see, we see individuals with um, IgG problems that manifest as brain problems very directly because of cytokines compete at the receptor sites. You know, you just have... Uh, so I don't know if that's part of what you do or what, you, what, you, what are your thoughts about immune uh, system dysregulation in, in the elderly? Boy, that's really an excellent question and very cutting edge. Um, you know, as you, you probably are well aware, uh, the whole study of immune functioning and, and inflammation is an emerging area of, of, of medical research and brain research and psychiatric research. Uh, it's, not, it's not become um, standard clinical practice yet to use these studies, at least not widely. Mm -hmm. But what is recognized is that psychiatric disorders that we treat, in addition to being brain illnesses, uh, often are illnesses of immune functioning, um, in inflammation, and, and, and oxidative damage. And readers these days, picking up any, any popular magazine, will, will, will it be hard to avoid references to oxidative damage and, and opportunities to buy antioxidants. Uh, to help mitigate that. We, we know that, that when people have depression, um, they have high levels of inflammatory mediators, cytokines, as you mentioned, um, in the brain and, and throughout the body. And we think that depression in particular, but other conditions like severe anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, actually bring about heightened states of inflammation, which may be part of how they wreak havoc physically throughout the body on other organ systems and, and shorten longevity for older adults. Conversely, we know that a lot of these other conditions that involve heightened inflammation, arthritis, chronic lung diseases and the like, uh, take a toll on the brain and can lead to depression, and it may be by creating a hyperinflammatory state in the brain. So there's this sort of two-way street going on between the brain and the rest of the body in terms of, of uh, heightened levels of inflammation and the damage that's wreaked on various organs, including the brain, uh, by these heightened levels of inflammation. It's, it's not yet considered, at least as far as I know, standard practice to measure inflammatory mediators um, in, in psychiatric patients, but many of us uh, are beginning to wonder whether we ought to be doing that routinely. Well, the chairman of the Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology is very strong on making it standard of practice. The guy at, the, at Harvard uh, and um, Alessio Fasano is uh, lectures internationally. He's he's on it. Of course, the you're quite right because we get some heat. Uh, we're in Virginia Beach, so we're not in a in an academic center down here by any means in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, and uh, we get some heat because. Uh, and we don't do it routinely, I'll tell you that, Gary. We do it if somebody is refractory to care. I mean, it's one of these things, when you get an older person, uh, complexity is is ubiquitous. I mean, it's not going to be just uh, a simple presentation. And if we're going to look at the complexity and somebody doesn't respond well, then I think we have to walk the next mile or we're just not doing our job, as, as you pointed out. I, I think that's right. And, you know, there are studies that, show that high levels of inflammatory mediators are a risk uh, for uh, or an indicator of those patients who may not respond as well to treatment. And, and it may be that in the future, in addition to prescribing psychiatric treatments for patients, we'll also give them anti-inflammatory agents as a way to make those treatments more effective. Yeah, so true. So then when you, uh, what is your follow-up protocol? What are the things that you think a good practitioner and, a, and or a, a patient should look for regarding follow-up after they're identified and they get treated? We, we touched on follow-up a little bit because you and I both know that if you're going to work with an individual and we're dealing with the complexity and the biomedical complexity of a human being, it isn't right just out of the box. Nothing works just out of the box with humanity, in my experience. 
So the question is, how do you think uh, you should follow up, and what do you do in your in your geriatric practice up there? Uh, right. So uh, I think that's that's really a critical question. I, you know, I think the first thing is that you're right. There is no one size fits all treatment, and what one of the things that that patients or their family members ought to look for is if it feels like uh, a prescriber, whether it's a psychiatrist, uh, another specialist, a primary care doctor, has in a very quick and cursory and, and almost knee-jerky, reflexive kind of way, taken out the prescription pad and written a prescription for an antidepressant within just a few minutes of talking about the problem, that's probably not a good sign. Yes, sir. You ought to be concerned about that. The, if, you know, once the evaluation, if it feels very, very thorough, you can feel more confident. I think the next step is that during that initial visit or maybe if they have you come back for the, a second visit to talk about the results of the evaluation and maybe ask questions, recommendations for treatment ought to feel individualized um, based on a, the person taking time to talk with you about your your preferences, your desires, what your hopes and expectations were for the kind of treatment you were hoping to get. And they should be able to explain the different options and help you understand which one is tailor-made to your needs best and what, what leeway is there for you to explore different options. I think then the next step is once you've decided what direction to go in, you, you should, if you're Given a prescription, whether it's uh, to go and see a therapist for talking treatment or psychotherapy or a recommendation for a whole uh, a slew of alternative lifestyle treatments that sometimes can help depression or medicine for depression, there ought to be a, a, a visit fairly soon within um, a week, two weeks, maybe a month at most to see how you're making out and make sure the treatment is, is on track and, and progressing as it should and to troubleshoot any problems that may arise early. If you don't have that, that's a warning sign that the treatment is, is not what it should be. Quite so. Completely agree. Yeah, and uh, then the next thing is, uh, as uh, I know many of our listeners will say, well, what happens with signs of treatment failure? What do you do if you're kind of against the wall, you've had a person that's knowledgeable, that's caring, that tried you on two or three antidepressants, and you're just kind of hitting a wall. It's not going where it needs to go. You've tried one that's a little bit on the stimulant side, like Welbutrin. You've used the traditional uh, Effexor Venlafaxine, Lexapro, Selexa, those kinds of medications, but you're still hitting a wall. So then what would you as a clinician say, what's the next step that a person should take? So it might be at this point, complementing the medicine with psychotherapy or what people refer to as counseling. With, with uh, depression in later life, there's a lot of evidence that uh, for severe depression, medications work the best, although counseling can work as well in milder cases. But for the most severe cases, uh, medication combined with counseling is the most effective treatment there is. And sometimes older adults are reluctant to have that based on a decades old stigma about counseling and reluctance to talk about problems with professionals. But therapy these days is different than what they imagine it, it, it to be and what it was like a few decades ago. And, and most older adults find that once they get started in it, they're able to put a toe in the water they actually find it to be a, a, a pretty helpful, pleasant experience that makes them feel better. So adding that can help. Um, sometimes adding a different kind of medicine to, to an antidepressant, uh, something that, that complements it can work, or using these medicines in combination. Sometimes um, various kinds of nutritional supplements have been shown by a fair amount of research to make medicine for depression work better. So things like um, fish oil or, mm -hmm. or L-methylfolate, a, a form of folic acid, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes can help uh, making sure that vitamin D levels are adequate, that, that thyroid levels are adequate, can, can be important. And then things like exercise can make a difference or adding, adding um, mindfulness practices like mindfulness meditation or yoga or Tai Chi have been shown with, um, with a substantial and ever-increasing amount of research to not only have some antidepressant benefits on their own right, but to make treatment other treatments for depression work a little bit better. So 
making the treatment plan um, more broad and comprehensive, it would be the next step. I like that word comprehensive, Gary. That's it's one of my favorite words. I totally agree with you on that. Let's take a moment to dig in a little bit further because it was almost a tease. And uh, you didn't mean it as a tease, of course, but I just was thinking, uh, I was identifying with a listener listening to you uh, about the different kind of therapy, the way it is now versus the way it was. So could you say a little more about that? Obviously, I've got some of my own opinions about it, but I'd be interested in yours because you're doing it all the time with that population. So as you probably appreciate, and, and, and many listeners may, if they think about their own perception of psychotherapy, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decades-old um, just to a large degree, out of date um, notion about the classical psychoanalytic hour. You lay on the couch and you talk about your childhood, yeah. and and that's a that's a, a form of, of practice that that um, is still is still going on. There are specialists committed to it. It's very useful for certain kinds of problems, and it may even be an effective treatment for some older adults. But for the majority of older people with depression, it's not going to be the most helpful or useful treatment for them. Most of the treatment, the, the, the psychotherapy or counseling that older adults will find useful is shorter term. It may be somewhere between five to 10 or maybe as many as 20 visits in the course of a year. It can be as short as two or three sometimes. And it's, it's really uh, talking, sitting up in a chair face to face with a therapist who could be a psychiatrist, but it might be a psychologist or a social worker or another form of, of, of psychotherapist. And it's really focusing on on day to day current life problems. Uh, in, in depression, there are a number of different approaches to doing this, uh, including a, a form of treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy. Another one that's been very well studied is uh, a form of treatment called interpersonal psychotherapy for depression. And a third is problem solving. Um, treatment for depression. And all of these really involve looking at what's going on in the person's life now and how are they dealing with it. And it involves typically looking at at um, de- patterns of thinking or reacting that are depressive that contribute to the symptoms and helping people learn how to, how to handle different situations and problems differently. Well said. Not so much involved with what is that going on in that mysterious unconscious but how are you going to live your life? What can you do to improve your current circumstances that's going to really work for you in the context of your life? Right, and, and, and how to identify when your thinking has become negative or pessimistic or, or unduly hopeless or excessively worried, and to learn how to interrupt that stream of thought so it doesn't uh, create a vicious cycle that makes you more and more down in the dumps and, and gloomy. So, in conclusion, thank you so much, Gary. You've done, it's a, it's a very interesting, you're a very articulate, delightful guy to talk to. Uh, what would you say would be, uh, in addition to your book, do you have any specific recommendations, like today, tomorrow, that somebody could go to and say, hey, I want to get the book, I really need to look at this book because I don't think more carefully about myself. But what else would be something that you sometimes say to your patients, hey, go go here and look at this structured system or, or whatever you have to recommend in that regard? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I think they'll find the book to be uh, not only very accessible and readable, and they'll feel as if it's talking directly to them. Uh, so I think it's a really good place to start. Um, and obviously I wrote it because there aren't a lot of good sources of information that oh. older adults and their families find um, helpful. But uh, there is a national organization, the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry, uh, and and an affiliated uh, educational foundation, the Geriatric Mental Health Foundation. Both of those organizations are on on the internet. They have good websites that have some information on them, including information about how to find a specialist in in a listener's area. Um, and so that a next step might be. If you're not getting anywhere, get a consultation with a specialist uh, who knows something about treating these conditions in older adults. And these websites are, are places where you might be able to find someone local, uh, or, or if not, they're not local, at least within a reasonable car drive so you could go for a second opinion. 
That, well, that, I recommend that strongly. That's fantastic. Well, this has been psychiatrist, geriatric psychiatrist, Dr. Gary Moak. Dr. Moak, thank you so much. Let's close by giving our listeners your link to your website so they can go and and find out what you're saying out there and perhaps connect with your book on a different level. We'll have it on the show notes, but if they want to connect with you personally. Uh, sure. And, and in fact, they can, they can go to my website. I, I have occasion. I have a blog and some information articles that we post there. And they also can sign up for a, a periodic newsletter that uh, comes out with new developments in the field that they may want to stay abreast of. So it's www.mochgeriatricpsychiatry.com. It's a very long website to spell out, but if they simply do a search on my name, Dr. Gary S. is in Sam Moak, M-O-A-K, it'll come up as one of the, the top two or three hits, and they'll be able to find me there. Gary, you're telling me there are a lot of not, <laughs> not a lot of Mokes out there. <laughs> You'll pop right up, huh? I think so. That's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. I know you're looking forward to the summer up there in God's country. And uh, I know our listeners really appreciate you taking the time to spell out a lot of these issues for them. Well, thanks. It's been a pleasure to be on with you this afternoon. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive, misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications, like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.